So how do you go from one life to a risen life? I think the answer begins by dying between the life and the risen life. That's probably why Luther was so emphatic about baptism. That we would grasp and understand that here we are plunged into death and symbolically raised to a new life and a new relationship with God and with one another. To remember that this must be done on a daily basis. And though baptism takes place only once, our remembrance of that baptism takes on every day of our life. And it's not so much we are called to seek spiritual perfection, but we are being called to seek spiritual progress as we are plunged each day into the remembrance of our need and our dependency upon God's grace and God's love to be resurrected as something different. But it's hard to get people to really grasp a new reality. There are some things I've been saying to the church for more than three decades now, and the church and bishops never wanted to listen to me. And now that much of the things that I saw coming are happening in the world, I don't feel much like saying, told you so, as much as saying, church, it's time to die. It's time to be raised up new and different. You don't have to like it but it's time. But it doesn't matter. You can talk and talk, and if folks aren't ready, they won't believe you. I'll give you an example. I was born in April of 1955 at 2.35 p.m. I know that because it says so on my birth certificate. It even has the day on it. I know that because my mother would tell me stories about me being born. Apparently it was a big deal for her. I'm the first and last child of my parents. It took them nearly a decade before they had me. And then soon after my mother died, my father remarried. And lo and behold, my father and my stepmother took me out to celebrate my birthday, fancy restaurant, good food, nice steak, all that kind of bit. But I said to them, this is May. I was born in April. And they called me a liar. And I got my driver's license out. I said, here, it says this on my, and they said, that's not real. And this went on for several years, and finally I got frustrated. I went down to the Lucas County Courthouse and got my birth certificate and said, look, it says when I was born, right here. They said, oh, that's a fake. And that year, they took me out for my birthday in the month of May. For whatever reason, their own immaturity, their own inability to say we're wrong, they decided when I was born. And nothing I could do to get them to believe something else would ever do. When the women in the tomb, they only have death in their minds. In a very real way, they carry the ritual symbols of death in their arms as they walk to the tomb to see Jesus, the dead Jesus. Death and grief are such a part of their mindset that it is not only 
that they're already on the way, that they suddenly say, hey, hey, uh, there's a big stone in front of the tomb. How's that going to get moved? And they are filled with such grief, there is no room for anything else. And I wonder what went on through their heads when they became aware that the stone had already been moved. I wonder, once they are confronted with the reality of his absence, why they are so terrified. One translation says they were trembling and bewildered. When confronted with the unexpected, this new reality, it seems terror and confusion was the norms for the followers of Jesus. Faced with a new reality, these faithful runs run far from it. Full of terror, terror in this unexpected reality. Full of fear at the unpredictable. Full of bewilderment at sudden change of what they can't comprehend. Full of terror, full of fear, full of bewilderment, and full of it due to the sudden change. They become empty of faith, empty of understanding, empty of remembering, empty of courage. Before they stood at the empty tomb, they had been full of everything but faith in the promises of Jesus Christ. And Jesus was simply their teacher and their leader, a good person who was now in their heads simply good and dead. The life they had lived before they got to the empty tomb was full of a life on their terms, even if it was grief and sorrow. A person who is full is someone who is able to look at her or his life and say, dang, every need is met, every fear is silenced, and every obstacle is overcome. Most would say, that's what I want. That's what I'm aiming for. But let's be just plain, brutally honest. If we believe that we're complete, that our lives are as they should be, then this day, then this message, this reality of the resurrected Jesus Christ just isn't for us. Here's the deal, my brothers and my sisters. Easter isn't for full people. It isn't for the I have it all together life. It isn't for life is full of understanding life. Here is a life shattering truth. Easter is for empty people. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is for those who figured out that in this life, full is a fleeting feeling. Most of us spend our money on stuff that will disappear day in and day out or a week later. I don't care what it is. Our clothes, our food, gas, all that we would consume will eventually disappear. Many of us fill ourselves with food only to be hungry a few hours later. Many of us fill ourselves with some kind of mind or spirit numbing substance only to be filled with the vile shame or the actions of stupidity. Some of us have been full of grief and filled with loneliness after losing someone close. Others know what it's like to have your life full of health problems or your family full of anger or fighting, full of, full of prayers unanswered, full of fear of haunting us, a depression that lingers, a faith that's stagnant, a marriage that's struggling, kids who are in pain, in-laws who are hurting or being hurt, a future that is uncertain, we can get full of it. And we could ask more questions until all of you were covered. Such an idea may just begin to make you remember how empty we are. Yes, there are those who know that fullness is fleeting and what it feels like to be empty. And the good news is that all who fall into this category 
are the ones for whom Easter comes. The resurrection is not for full people. Easter is not for people that have it all together. Easter is for people who know they are empty and need to be filled. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing. They said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Do you catch all the words? Alarmed, fled, terror, amazement, nothing, afraid. Easter itself has its origins in the emptiness of heart that overwhelms disciples who've seen their Savior die and the anxiety of mind that comes from expecting to see his body instead of hearing a risen one. We, like those women, stand before the good news and flee without being able to utter one word. It's not merely that it's too good to be true, but sometimes it's just too hard to believe it's true. The temptation is to look at emptiness and see it as a bad thing, though. The truth is, it's the only way we can be filled with the promises of God the resurrection itself. As frightening as bewildering it can be, we should want an empty tomb. It means everything. That God is real and God has kept God's promises to us. The empty tomb means that Jesus' death on the cross was in fact a work of forgiveness. It means that all the mistakes we've made that leave us wondering whether or not God loves us has been punished and put aside. And that's not all. We have a promise of a tomorrow. No matter what today may bring, no matter what comes our way, when it is all said and done, we have a tomorrow. The empty tomb fills an empty world with all kinds of possibilities. Now, I know that some of you might be here because it's Easter and someone in your family says, all I want is chocolate bunnies and you're behind in church. I know that's true. But even for those of you who are skeptical, those of you who may have serious doubts, shouldn't you at least want it to be true? I mean, shouldn't you at least want it to be true that love wins in the end? that poverty disappears, that the horribleness of maltreatment in life is gone, that there's peace on earth, that, that the weapons of mass destruction are pounded into the ground and made into plowshares. Shouldn't you at least want that? Whether you believe it's true or not? Is it so, so horrible? to think that what we need to do is get rid of all this violence in the world and to know at last shalom, peace, wholeness. But this story is a little weird. How did the message about the resurrection ever get out? Let's keep it in Mark. Let's not worry about the other Gospels. There are little additions to the Gospel of Mark. Most of those additions come much later in the history of the church because the history of the church saw this ending and said, well, that's weird. How can it be that those women who had the message about the risen Jesus, 
with a message to tell his disciples that go to Galilee, there he's going to be. They ran out of there so afraid that they were silent and didn't tell anyone. How in the world did the message of the gospel and resurrection of Jesus Christ get into the world if we kept our mouths shut? And there's where the power of God takes our emptiness away and says, well, if I can't rely on you, I'll do it myself. If I can't trust in you, I'll find someone else. And maybe it won't be my disciples. Maybe it'll be some street guy on the corner who is so empty and so desperate to be filled with life that he'll start talking about me. Because you cannot keep this resurrection silent. It, God will not allow it to stop. We don't have to do anything, but God will do it. And here's the gift, brothers and sisters. We get to do it. We still get to share it. We don't have to run away afraid and be silent. We can jump into this new reality. You can be the peacemakers. You can be the givers of forgiveness. You can be the ones who unite each other. You can be the ones that show mercy. You can be the ones that promise and show people that there is life and hope and tomorrow. So what are you going to do? Cling to this new reality or live with the old one? Be silent or speak? When you leave this place, how will you leave it? The same? We're ready to plunge into a new reality.